Welcome back to the Catacombs Podcast for Episode 2. I'm Ryan McLaughlin, and with me here is, of course, my co-host, John Dangler. John, how are you doing this week, man? I'm doing my best, man. I've been running around a lot. I actually <laughs> just got back this afternoon from St. Augustine. I took my wife over for the weekend. It was her birthday. and uh, Excellent. Got to go over there and explore. Uh, actually, my, my favorite thing, I think, was I went and saw the Pirates Museum, and I have, like, a pirate obsession. So I... I uh, I just geeked out on the pirates the whole time and came For, back with a bunch of new homework. If you're one of our listeners and you don't know about San Augustine, Florida, it is a uh, a hidden gem of a vacation spot. So, so many fun things to do. Glad to hear that you and Erica got to celebrate her birthday. Yep. That's fantastic, man. Uh, we are back here for episode two, and we kind of talked about episode two as being what I'm affectionately calling the sex, drugs, and rock and roll episode. (laughs) We're going to be talking a lot about bodies. We're going to be talking a lot about minds. We're going to be hopefully connecting those two things to avatars and VR and some of the pressing questions that we hinted at last episode. Uh, John, I want to start off by sharing with you a quote from my 11-year-old son. (laughs) He uh, overheard some of us talking about episode one in your living room, actually. And uh, he overheard the conversation about uh, baptism that we kind of hinted about in episode one. Mm -hmm. And you know my 11-year-old, so you can probably picture uh, the the very thoughtful expression on his face as he shared this quote. But he said, Dad, uh, human beings should be baptized in physical water because we are born in nature. You could baptize an AI in the metaverse, though, if you wanted to, <laughs> because they're born in ones and zeros. Oh, that's so good. I, you know, so there's so much to break down there, right? Uh, I was a little caught off guard by the second half of that statement because he granted personhood to AIs <laughs> really quickly, much quicker than I thought he would. And offering salvation to the AI. <laughs> I, I, love, I love it. I love it. Just... Oh, the door man. is open. The the soteriology of AI <laughs> to be continued on a future episode, hopefully. Right, yeah, I don't know if I'm ready for that nah. one. Let's, <laughs> no one's ready for that one. <laughs> the first half of the statement, though, uh, did not surprise me as his dad, because I know uh, knowing about him as a person, his outlook on life, his particular spirituality, it is very connected with nature. It is very connected with the physical. Uh, some of his deepest spiritual uh experiences as he's told me have come out uh hiking the appalachian trail with me camping uh dude loves the woods dude finds god in the woods uh wasn't surprised by that at all but uh what i thought was interesting about it for our purposes maybe we can break it down a little bit because he also came at it with a whole host of assumptions that i think we have to name before we proceed any further with this because Uh, I think I ultimately agree with the first half of the statement, at least. Mm -hmm. But it's not obvious that we can just get there really quickly. So, first of all, I think the first assumption that he takes into account here is that the physical world is real. And that, of course, runs contrary to huge swaths of the philosophical and religious traditions uh, worldwide, right? Of course, we've got uh, the Eastern traditions. Buddhism and Hinduism in particular would maintain that physical reality is an illusion, right? They're not alone in that. We also have uh, religious traditions uh, that have been influenced in the West by Hermetic philosophy, which maintains that uh, all in the universe is actually mind, right? And that uh, we are minds operating within a greater mind. And that's been influential on certain strands of Judaism, certain strands of Christianity, certain strands of Islam. Um, so it's not at all obvious that the physical world is necessarily real. We can't take that for granted, I don't think. The second assumption that he kind of makes there, and again, I think I ultimately agree with him, but it, it bears naming, is that the physical universe is good. And that runs contrary to a lot of folks that do take the physical reality, uh, physical reality as being real, right? Uh, That would run contrary to Gnosticism, which uh, had its day back in the classical world, both within Christianity and without. Mm -hmm. So those are assumptions that he's operating under. And and I love the connection that he makes, like humanity... uh, is of nature and nature is good and therefore finds 
soteriology and redemption within the confines of nature. He sees nature as being a means of grace, you know, very much falling in line with that Franciscan spirituality I mentioned, uh, being a huge fan of last time we talked. But uh, it's uh, it's not as obvious to me that we can just proceed on those assumptions. Yeah, those are, you know, it's really interesting. The um, I well, I'll tell you what I'll, I'll I'll try to do this. You know, I told you last time we talked. I went to um, I was going. I was anticipating going to a uh, group. It's kind of a learning community that I was invited to be part of. That oh, is that's right. trying to explore kind of the church, like how the church might use or embrace or whatever. It's a learning community around VR. Sure. Uh, as social VR, as mission field, as people are, I mean, there were churches there that are building church services, metaverse kind of church service mm-hmm. worlds or whatever. Um, I, I have tons of questions about all that. I will say overall, um, I was really pleased with the group and actually what surprised me, it really did. I anticipated having a taking issue, you know, with things cause well, Christians, you know, like I take issues <laughs> with lots of what Christians are doing and churches and this and that. If you don't have issues with what Christians are doing, you probably don't take your Christianity seriously, right? Yeah. So I was very nervous on that front, but what I realized was I was in a room full of people saying yes to new technology and trying to figure it out. And Mm -hmm. I so resonate with that. Yeah. That when I'm in that posture of open engagement, there isn't anything to be critical of. It's it's a weird thing. It's like a kind of openness, which I approach the future with that I realized was like a medicine Mm. to like, I'm like, so you're building like a, you know, like where I would, what, You know, sure, I might have thoughts about what, like, why we might not want to just, like, digitize the mistakes we've made in the real world with, like, ecclesiology and stuff like that. Uh, And and roll in, like you said, unnamed assumptions that church is a Mm -hmm. building or church is an institution or church. You know, there's a million things that would apply to that space. Anyway, the reason I bring it up is, one, well, lots of things. I told you guys I'd tell you about it, but partly I wanted to say it was great. I enjoyed it. A lot of good things there. But... One of the things, and I didn't interrupt these folks, um, but there were two people that shared. And um, so there's a there's a handful of people that have been doing like two plus, I mean, one guy's been doing like digital ministry stuff since like dial up chat rooms. Like he's right just on. been trying to use the internet as a means of engaging people to talk about the kingdom of God and faith and this and that and the other. And people have been really critical all on the way, as you'd imagine. Well, now that they're using like VR, apparently people are like these, they're heretics and they're people are critical of them because you know how church people go. Right. But, and, and I just thought, Oh, I'd be curious to hear what that is, but I just chalk it up to, you know, people like to bicker and people sure. always have a problem with things and whatever, you know, but then one of them said, you know, uh, I'm getting accused of being a Gnostic, which really, really surprised me first of all um and i was like wait so i so i'm familiar with gnosticism i actually was obsessed with gnosticism for a while because when i was in religious studies well one i realized that most (laughs) most people are unknowingly gnostic like just kind of western christians thinking that their soul is going to be set free from their body inherited by you know, inherited from kind of a a Western civilization, highly influenced by Plato. And like, there's just so much there. Right. So, so I go, okay. Um, anyway, but I, I didn't want to interrupt because I was like, Oh, I want to talk about that and I'm going to see him again. So whatever. So I didn't, I didn't interrupt, but I, I started thinking a lot about like, why would they be called Gnostics? Well, when I got home, I have a buddy named Ryan, another Ryan. I actually have to call you Mick Ryan now to my wife. So she knows (laughs) who I'm talking about. So you're Mick Ryan. Uh, I was like, I'm going to meet up with Mick Ryan because the other Ryan only the best friends that you have are are, are, are Ryan's, right? Yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah. I have a handful. So, so this other Ryan is, um, he's a blue collar construction worker, um, you know, smart dude, but not like educated dude, right? Right He he runs construction sites. Really smart though. 
And I'm on the phone with him one day and, and I saw, I was, he's like, how was your trip? And I was telling him about it. And by the way, I haven't talked to him much about this. And he was like, like we got off on the whole baptism thing. And nice. he's like, I'm going to tell you exactly what's right. And I'm always right. So just listen to what I say, like whatever. <laughs> I was like, you've never thought about this at all. He's like, it's, it's whatever. It's the confidence that comes with being a Ryan. Oh, I love it. Yeah. So he, he I'm trying to think, well, then he basically made the case like, like your son, like, no, it has to be done in physical water. It can't be done in your body. The idea of doing that out there is silly, like whatever. But then, and then I, and then I pushed back. I was like, well, let, let me take the other side then. And let me push yeah. back a little bit. And like, you know, cause I don't know that I should be so quick to discount. Even in the last conversation you said like, yeah, but what about the kid yeah. who actually surrendered and said, I want to, I want to give my life to Jesus and I want to be baptized in this faith. And this is the medium within which we meet. Like, wasn't that a real public pronouncement to him in his, mm-hmm. in his community? Because mm-hmm. that, in some level, is functionally what this act is, right? So, so okay, so I say, and then he, and he's like, well, you know, I could probably easily make an argument for the other side. And I was like, okay, go for it. And he's like, yeah, I mean, I can see both sides. I still think I'm right, but let me, let me take a stab at the other <laughs> side. But then Ryan proceeded to share, he's like, well, I mean, the body's basically just a vehicle. Like, I'm driving a truck right now. Mm. And he's like, and I could just get out of this truck, and I could get into this other truck. Because the soul is the me, is I, what's talking to you right now. And it could be, and I said, Ryan, actually, the, what's interesting is like, that's a, that's, that's a very commonly held idea that is not like necessarily found in the Bible. That didn't come from like the, um, that didn't come from a Hebrew mind, um, that, that, that concept and, and actually really, really, really maps to. Uh, something called Gnosticism. Mm. And, and I was like, Oh, that's interesting. It's weird. Cause I didn't ask those folks out there, but it, it like talking to Ryan made me go, Oh, I could see how saying the body isn't an important part of this because it's like the soul that matters, which I don't think is what they're saying. No, they're like, yeah, body put on a VR headset. There's like a totally different conversation because they're not actually talking about disembodiment, but what people hear is like, Oh, then your body doesn't matter. We're back to this kind of, uh, disembodied spirits that matter or whatever. And I go, Oh, Oh, interesting. When I heard Ryan give it back to me, I was like, Oh yeah. Oh, I see why people would call them Gnostics. Now I can't wait to follow up and have that conversation with them because nothing they say resembles Gnosticism. Actually, like you right, said, talk to right. them. I mean, these are solid dudes using a new tech, trying to figure it out, going, I don't know. We're going to do our best out here. Sure, sure. Uh, we're not even in the same state. You know, one of the guys that was there that they hired, actually, who had come to faith, joined their discipleship thing. They're in California, like their home, mm-hmm. church, community, whatever. But they have a metaverse expression that they do. And they're now one of their staff team who's leading like this young, young men's discipleship thing, all mostly through VR chat is, uh, he lives in North Carolina. Yeah. You know? And it's like, they're in total community, but they're not physically present. Now he was physically present with them at this. And they're like, yeah, right occasionally right we go on. on a trip together or we visit or whatever. Like we become friends. We've met mm-hmm. each other. Mm-hmm. Oh, and this is back to your the assumption that it's real. So I'll end with this because he goes, you know, we have these IRL. They kept saying like these IRL meetups. And I was like, hey, uh, guys, can we not? And someone else brought this up, too. Can we not um, contrast digital with real? Because like, like I think it's problematic. Yeah. And because even what you had said, like. So, so this guy that was there, very smart guy, he actually lives in St. Pete. I'm hoping to connect us and maybe have him on the show at one point. He's studying uh, AI and ethics. Oh, yeah. Yeah, which I'm like, we, oh, we they, definitely yeah, need yeah, him this, on the show. This is yeah. a, so he was there, and he, he did like a quadrant, like drew a quadrant on a whiteboard and said, okay, well, you know, crossed on the middle and said, okay, let's put real on the top and let's put fake on the bottom or mm-hmm, whatever, arbitrarily. Mm-hmm. And then on the left, let's put digital, and on the right, let's put physical. He's like, there are a lot of things that we do physically that are fake. Yeah. In fact, a lot of our gatherings and church services are completely fake. We're just there physically. He's like, and we could do that digitally. It's fake. It's a Absolutely. digital fake. Absolutely. He's like, but there are things that are done digitally that yeah. are real. And then there's things done uh, digitally 
that are fake or whatever. I, I might have miss, missed up my quadrant thing. Yeah, yeah. But he was like, L- can we think digital, physical, real, fake? Real means something. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you even talking about like, well, if this is all generated from our mind or these are illusions. You know, the, the line that kept coming to mind is the, uh, the reality might be digital, but the struggle is real. I like that. <laughs> and, and I was like, you know, there is something about the word real that um, you're like, well, we assume that the physical is real. Interesting. And it's like, oh, that, that actually carries over to what, I mean, what do we even mean by this word? So let me push a little farther because I think that there's a lot to chew on here. Um, so Gnosticism, for those of our listeners that maybe haven't studied it in depth, yeah, let's do that. Was, a, was a pretty diverse religious expression. But the things that it tended to have in common were uh, this idea that there was a gnosis, which means knowledge, uh, a gnosis that uh, was secret, that if you learned it would be the key to your salvation. The second thing was that that salvation was specifically salvation from the prison that is the physical body, the prison that is the physical world. So it was learning the the gnosis to be set free from your body. So in Gnosticism, I think that uh, it's not that the body is an illusion like in a lot of That's Eastern right. thought. It's that the body is real, but it's a negative experience. It's actually evil. It's actually evil. Mm-hmm. Um, and to your point earlier that you made, John, this is a... A, a subconscious but very prevalent attitude in most American religion. We carry right? it in, yeah, that's right. We, um, and you know, I, uh, I I hearken back to my experiences in evangelical youth group as a teenager where, uh, you know, you, you mentioned that it's not a biblical view. We had verses that we would use to justify yeah, this. Everyone's view. got their they, You know, the, uh, our, our, our fight is... Uh, not you know this world is not our home. Whether it was in our the fight, body, yeah, I do not ab- know. absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, not to say that those verses were uh, well exegeted when that viewpoint was taken. Well, but... and there and there are later later Pauline or pseudo Pauline letters mm-hmm. that are way more absolutely. Yeah, you have way more to work with in the later. Pauline letters than really any any other 100%. thing, but it, but it just doesn't map to a Hebrew worldview in general. Just let's just go to um, you know, the, like OG religion of the folks before Christianity mm. as as like a culture and a worldview even. Yeah, for sure. So I want to circle back around to this idea within Gnosticism that you know, like I said, is subconsciously imbibed in a lot mm-hmm. of American religion that. Uh, what it means to be saved is to be set free from the physical body, right? Um, so let me circle back around to the question of whether our, our friends, and you know, I'm playing devil's advocate here so that we're clear. I don't actually believe this, but let's get back to this idea that uh, our new friends are Gnostic because they're holding church within VR. Is it maybe not that they're denying the reality of the physical body? Is it that there's something implicit within what they're doing to say that uh, actually the physical body is an impediment and that we have improved upon ministry as it was done. We've improved upon church as it was done. We've improved upon spirituality as it was done in the physical body by means of VR. And I, I'll, I'll put this caveat out there. Um, one of the things is someone who's actively involved in education in VR mm-hmm. It, one of the temptations that I face in my own thought life is thinking about VR as being an improvement upon all education that's come before because I can do things now that I was never able to do as a teacher. I can take kids on field trips to Mars. I've done it. Yeah. I can take kids on field trips to ancient Rome. You can't do that without a time machine in, in the yeah. world of atoms rather than the worlds of, uh, of ones and zeros, right? So um, is there, and I'll, I'll land this plane here, is there an inherent Gnosticism or a subtle Gnosticism or an implied Gnosticism in doing Church in the Metaverse because you are coming uh, a, and presenting this new and improved way of doing Church? Yeah, I'm. this is all so interesting to me, man. I'm really glad we're doing this yeah, and man. talking about this. So I... I so I want to just flesh out a little more of the Gnostic kind of yeah. picture here. I think a important part for those that aren't familiar 
um, is kind of the cosmology, cosmogony. So like the the world, the entire physical existing world um, that you know, if you're if you're a Christian, let's say, or, or or many many religions would say like it was created by God. Sure. So the Gnostics actually had a very different mythology that it was it was created by uh, the word they use is like a demiurge. Mm-hmm. So it's a it's a like let's say a lesser god. So for those listening, now I'm gonna be oversimplifying. So if you're wildly familiar with Gnosticism, forgive me, but like there is a true good god. Um, but there's like a, there's, there's gods, right? There's a handful of gods, but then there is a, uh, there is a God who actually kills. I think the story is he kills his mother whose name is wisdom, Sophia, and he chops her up into a bunch of little pieces. And then he creates the world out of those pieces and then reigns over his creation. Um, that evil, ignorant, ignorant would be the more like he unenlightened, Mm-hmm. Um, Demi urge that like destroyed wisdom for the sake of his own kind of hubris becomes the God of the old Testament becomes the creator God that the, that is so, so there is actually like groups of whether Jewish or Christian Gnostics that like the entry into the community would be the denunciation of Yahweh or the God of the, the God of the Bible, because that God is taught as, well, the creator God as like the true God. And they're going, that's not actually the case. Right. Mm -hmm. So then this all then makes sense of like, no. So Sophia, that spiritual wisdom, that, that true divinity is in you trapped. Mm -hmm. Um, but, is wrapped in sin and evil flesh. This whole world was made out of a crime. And so that knowledge of that will set you free from this. And I think that's an interesting, I think it's interesting to know that, but it's helpful to know why this like huge valuation of the spirit. And then the Gnostics love them some Plato, right? Because the world of the forms, like it, like when the Nag Hammadi library was found, which for those of you guys that don't know, like it's like 46 or 47 in Nag Hammadi. Right. Yeah. There is a, like a shepherd boy finds this, it's, you know, very close around the same time as the Dead Sea Scrolls actually, but they find this library of Gnostic texts. So, so some of you might, you know, have open your Bible and go, you got the gospel of Mark, Luke, John, Matthew, but then you've heard there's these other gospels, the gospel of Thomas, the gospel of Mary. There's these other stories. And like, why aren't they in my Bible? Well, many of those were Gnostic texts. Some of them are incredibly beautiful, incredibly good. Um, but among them, when they found that library was Plato's writings as well. They found a full volume of the Republic. They found like, it was like, Oh, this is like sacred text mm. to the Gnostics. Like it maps, it maps substantially. And I actually think that's a little more to the point of why Christian Christianity today so resembles Gnosticism. I actually don't think it's the Gnostic mythology or the Gnostic gospels. We don't have any idea what they even said or believed. Like some do sure. that have studied them, but generally sure. we don't. But that we are Western, that we're Platonic, that we're, we're Hellenized. I, go ahead. No, that's interesting. I want to stand up for Plato a little bit on this because uh, there were also right around that time uh, – folks who were called you know middle platonists mm-hmm. uh and plotinus is probably the most fam- most famous example of that but uh these guys were also actively fighting against the gnostics right so plotinus had uh i believe he had a book called against the gnostics <laughs> not to put too fine a point on it um i think yeah so flesh out a little bit more why plato might be involved here in these attitudes because to my mind yeah, there's that idea that physical reality um, comes from the forms, comes from the, the mind it. of God. It, but yeah, yeah, go ahead. It, no, and, and I want to get yeah, to, yeah, yeah. I was saying all this is like a, a, maybe a winded preamble to get to actually your question. Sure. But I will. Um, it's very, I mean, it, there's one line to point to, and it's Socrates, who's like Plato's mouthpiece, who says, my soul is imprisoned in my body. That, that mm. in itself encompasses the entire thing. So it maps like there. So, so, and I, I, I'll flesh this out because I I do this a lot. I believe that all of us, if we live in the West in this day and age, we need to become familiar with this dualism Yeah, and know it and be able to name it. Like you wanted to name these assumptions in the beginning with your son. It's like, 
because we assume that there's like some truth to this. Now, in Plato's day, in the Gnostics for sure, there was a high value placed on the spiritual Mm -hmm. and a low value placed on the physical. Mm -hmm. But what happened then is later in the Enlightenment, there was a pendulum swing. There was no questioning of the construct of dualism. But there was a high value placed on the physical, the world of science, right. matter. That's what matters. Right. And there is a devaluing. You guys can have the world of superstitions and gods and genies. That's all hogwash and woo-woo and whatever. And both of those still resemble positions that many of us will hold today. We're having the same mm-hmm. conversation. One of the reasons I really like the Bible, honestly, in all of the world's religions is there was a very holistic view of man that said you are social you are psychological you are spiritual you are physical you you are all of those things and you're not one of those things those things are not separable um and and actually it's part that there's a holistic view of mankind that i really appreciate and why i think well ultimately christianity is a is a religion or a or a movement of faith that that goes yeah like bodies are resurrected like there's bodily incarnation like it really matters like incarnation is at the central of christian doctrine it's like oh it matters what happens to and with and in the body and actually it's probably inseparable yeah which the implied separableness of them is in plato is in gnosticism is in all of these things we believe Mm. that there is a body mind kind of different like we can differentiate these and hold them apart from each other which I don't think I, I genuinely I don't believe that's true, and I don't believe that the Bible teaches it. I do think it's appealing, and there's a reason for that. What I would call existential dualism. So you are a animal. You bleed. You have ooze, pus. You whatever. Yep. You take dumps. Probably you like to eat, and then oh, you have sex. All of those things. Physicality. Fucking, fucking and fighting. Yep. All of that, right? However, you're also capable of symbol. You're capable mm-hmm. of holding a concept like eternity. Th- this very conversation can be had because we are symbolic creatures right. that transcend our physicality. And, and existentially, we are dualistic beings. Mm-hmm. We, are, we are both you know, flesh and soul in some very real and profound way. But that, I think, is a whole li- holistically, that is what we are. And, mm-hmm. then, and then I would go, no, you, that, that's not a separable thing, I would say. So... Anyway, I hope hopefully that got a little bit to like why. So Plato's yeah. lumped in on that, and it's it's not an accusation. Oh, I love Plato. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. have so much to oh, but I think it's important to go. We inherited. So out of those two moves, philosophically and historically, we inherited the dualism that they both had. Mm-hmm. And I think you need to know that today when you realize what lenses you bring, even as you interpret what's happened. Like okay, we're talking about avatars. And, oh, isn't it interesting that we're defaulting to this weird old dualism that we have where I go, I'm not sure the same lens applies to this question is what I actually want to get to. I'm not sure it applies Um, because because it isn't it. No one is saying that there's like like they're not saying, well, the disembodied church is the better church, Uh, the VR church. Nobody. And actually, even Mm -hmm. with the kids you guys are educating, you might be able to take them on a field trip, but you probably also think it's important that they get off the headset and do push-ups. Yeah, for sure. You know what I mean? Like, take care of your body or eat a good diet or whatever. It's like, this isn't about, like, like, uh, what's the character from Ninja Turtles? Like, Krang? You remember Krang? Like, this isn't a brain in a a (laughs) robot or whatever. Although I was always like, "Eh, that's tight. What a great analogy, though, for that whole... uh, Man, I hadn't thought about Krang in years before you said that, but yeah. So, so yeah, so all of this is really interesting to me, and it's partly where I'm like, yeah, I don't, like we, we said in the kind of, I don't know, our thesis even beginning the show is like, I don't think we have the tools for this. Like, we don't know how to think like this. So what I think is important, why I'm saying this, is it's important to name them and go, we bring to our interpretation of the world or our interpretation of ancient texts or our interpretation of what we're mm-hmm. even reading and looking at today as we predict what's coming with the future and technology and all these things, we bring to it this dualism that we inherited. It's mm-hmm. an inherited lens. And for some, and I think a lot of, like, religious folks fall into a category that go, we care about the soul yeah. body be damned. And it's like, that's very much a Gnostic yeah. platonic okay. view of mankind. Those aren't the same, right. but they're in the same arena philosophically. But then later 
you can swing to the enlightened. And we are modern, postmodern, well, modern, at least, the children of the enlightenment. Yeah. And we go, you know, no, we're a little more Dawkins. We're a little more like what matters, the body, the flesh, the, what you mm-hmm. can weigh, what you can touch. And the world of the flying spaghetti monster is nonsensical and not worth my time or my attention. Right. Okay, sh- fair enough. But that's a pendulum swing, and we've inherited that too. We have. And then we bring that to the table. And we don't, we don't often know that we're wearing tinted glasses when we're viewing what we're looking at. And right. I go, well, if you at least know... Everything isn't rose colored. If you're, you know, you have these glasses, yeah. it's just important to know you bring these lenses, these templates to the table. Right. When you look at these things, so you can go. So, so back to your question, I don't think anyone's saying we found a better way. Good. What I do think they're saying, although they may say this is way better in like, there may be a bunch of stuff. Like you're like, well, I could take you on a field trip. Yeah. Oh, but I could probably tell you five things that I wish I could just like. Sure be present physically because that matters. Right. Um, sure. And, and so I don't know that they're saying that what it seems like people are doing is going, <laughs> there was a guy there that, uh, and I was surprised he was there. Honestly, he was like, J- I think he had never put a headset on. Um, I, and by the way, I, we didn't do it with him while he was there, which sucks. Next time we go, I'm bringing it. And I, well, I had it with me in my bag, but I just, I wasn't leading the show, but I'm like, yeah, we're going to make sure everyone leaves has done that. Pretty much everyone there is like practitioner using yeah. these, doing something with them. But there was a, and honestly, I'm going to, I'm going to caricaturize it. Forgive me if you're listening. Cause I, I, I imagine this might get bad to you, but like, he was just like, yeah, I don't know none of this. I just heard there's another place I could talk to people about Jesus. Like, you know, and very, very just like, I maybe didn't do the accent the way I pictured it, but like the, yeah, it was just like this very simple, like, yeah, I'm just an evangelist. Yeah. And there's, there's a place to engage people I'm in. And I'm like, you know, I love that actually. I mean, like, I don't know what he has planned or what he, what that looks like when he does it. I've seen horrific and beautiful versions of that based on the group of people he was with. I would, I would probably give him the benefit of the doubt and go, it's probably something good to come there. But like, you know, um, and then, and then the, I'll just, I'll I'll stop so you can pick up on this, but like, there's so many questions that emerge like, to me is like this gets back to then ecclesiology with these folks. Sure. Wait, what do we mean church? What is that even? Because I don't think we're clear on that. And I actually, it's funny. I got a lot of weird looks. Cause I told, I said, and I've said this to you too, but I said, I, and maybe even on the last episode, I'm not even sure that Christianity continued to exist after the empire accepted Christianity because we've only known centralized institutional mm. since then. And I said, I actually said that at this meeting and people were like head scratch. Cause it's like, what I'm saying is I think we need to fundamentally question right. all of the assumptions we carry into this. Like, right. Oh, we need a building and a pastor and a budget and a, what it's like, I don't, I where, where, where did any of that come from? Yeah, actually. And so I know we've kind of rabbit trailed a bit from that, sure, that sure, framework, sure. but, uh, Anyway, I think this question of dualism is really an important one to identify. But then you go, when we get into VR, I'm the whole time I've been going, what would Plato say about this? What would Aristotle say about this? What would, what would the Gnostics actually say about this? People that even believe this, like that let, that, you know, Valent, Valentinus, how do you say his name? Whatever, like Valentine, whatever. Think, uh, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like yeah. how would you even, how would you explain what's happening here because it is now it, it is to say, well, if we did this in the digital universe, like I think you put your finger on it last time is they're saying, well, it's an extension of the body. Yeah. And because there is a way in which like your son, very simply like my buddy, Ryan kind of redneck construction worker goes, nah, man, it's, it's real water. Yeah. You know, it's just like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, what are well, we talking about? <laughs> yeah. So I want to say a bunch of different things. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. One, that nah man it's real water response is uh backed up by two thousand years of Christian history right. if we're talking within the Christian it's tradition. Real water. Right. Uh it's real water. And that in itself is not just tradition. It's not just, well, that's how my grandfather baptized his congregants, so I'm gonna keep doing it that way. That's actually rooted in a theology that sees the physical world as not just real but also good, right? It sees 
in Genesis chapter one, God made X, Y, Z and saw that it was good. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's actually a pretty profound stance to take. Right. And it's a, it's a profound stance, not just in the religious context, like we've been talking about, but also the philosophical context that we've kind of skirted around a little bit. Philosophically, I think, you know, that dualism that you highlighted might actually be a step in the right direction, because on the one hand, you have philosophies that see all of reality as material. You hinted at that with the yeah. Enlightenment, right? On the other complete opposite end of the spectrum, you have, you know, actually the only thing that's real is mind. And you see this in philosophers like uh, Berkeley uh, in England about 300 years ago, if memory serves. You see this a lot in 19th century German philosophy that actually mind is what's real. The physical world, whatever, it it doesn't exist. It goes a little bit, even back to like some of the basic questions of uh, Descartes, right? For sure. It's, it's, oh, it's kind well, of and that's where I was going to yeah, go yeah. with this, right? Is like Descartes sees both mod- body and mind as being real. And that's actually uh, a pretty Christian stance to take, right? Is that the body and mind themselves, you cannot reduce the mind down to physical processes. Uh, like, you know, a modern materialist would say, you cannot just point to only the chemicals in your brain as being completely responsible for the phenomena that we experience in consciousness or the phenomena we call mind, right? Um, But nor can we completely dismiss the physical world as being uh, interpretations of the mind, right? That that dualism, that both mind and body exist. um, And, you know, to put a Christian spin on it, that both of them matter. Both of them are important. Um, you know, that goes right back to the teachings of Jesus that, you know, you, you have heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever commits lust in his heart has already committed adultery, right? Like so there's, there's a both. to the avatar question. It sure does. It sure <laughs> does. And that's where I wanted to go with this, right? Is that, okay. As, as I was marinating a little bit on the avatar question that we were talking about, uh, a couple of related questions, and I'll let you answer them in either order that you see fit. Um, The first question that comes to my mind, of course, is to what extent is, uh, you know, a sexual act committed by an avatar the same as a sexual act committed by a body? So the question there, like, you know, how much is the avatar an extension of the body, right? Um, The second question, though, is... uh, how closely related, John, you mentioned on the podcast last time that a huge part of your personal experience was uh, meeting Jesus while you were on acid. Yeah. And I love that about your testimony. It's, it's, uh, it, you are actually not the only person I know that has that so experience. Many. So, it's many. so many people, right? Um, so a materialist would look at that experience and say, yeah, look, his meeting with Jesus was the result of certain very identifiable chemicals that were in his bloodstream at that time. Right? I actually, I actually have a, uh, this is a long time ago. My buddy, yeah, Keith, man. Keith, if you're out there, he, uh, pretty hardcore atheist, sure. like, uh, very smart dude. Sure. Sure. We would argue all the time. We get up at the coffee shop and just read these books together. We read the atheist book. Then we read the Christian book and then we just go back sure, and forth. And, sure. Um, by the way, it's funny because he would often, just because he liked arguing, he'd go, okay, today I'm going to just grant that God exists. Cool. And I'm going to grant the Christian worldview. Granted. Cool. Um, but now I'm going to argue that I'm reprobate. And, like, so he was, like, the hardest Calvinist I ever argued with in my life, which was, he's like, I'm just not, there's, I'm not included. So, anyway, but but why I brought him up was he actually joked with me all the time that he's, like, because he's. When he loved going around talking with believers sure. and beating them up, basically, sure. like like intellectually, philosophically. He's like, one day I'm going to write a book for Christians called How Not to Do Evangelism. Mm. And I'm going to dedicate a chapter to you. It's going to be called <laughs> I Met God on LSD. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. Keith, if you're out there, come on the podcast, buddy. We'd love to talk to you. Um, so, yeah. So my second question is, okay. To what extent is your participation in VR via an avatar and the ethical choices that you make for your avatar on behalf of the actions your avatar takes, to what extent is it more like 
lusting after someone in your heart, uh, contrary to Jesus's commands, but perhaps not quite afoul of, uh, you know, legal doctrines that would see physical acts as mattering more in, say, like a divorce case, right? Or is it more like uh, your experience on LSD where there was a physical cause to a spiritual experience? I don't know where to go with this. Yeah, man. Um, it's funny. This is back to the like question of the real. I was going to ask you this earlier. I forget when exactly we were talking, but it's the same as what you're asking me now is like, I started thinking not necessarily of drugs, although they followed right on the footsteps Sure. in vi visionary experiences. Mm -hmm. So the Bible is full of tales of visions. Yeah. I mean, Revelation itself is, I mean, uh, as far as I could tell, is a full on hallucinogenic experience, you know. <laughs> um, but like there's, you know, even just the, uh, tr the the transfiguration story, like we see these characters, these sure. heroic ancient characters standing with Jesus glowing. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and it's like, well, is that real? Like and and did it really happen? And w and, and then, you know, it's funny, you, you said like the Christian would say like the body and the mind matter. Mm -hmm. What's funny is like the, I just always think it's really a trip that we use matter, like physical matter. And, and I go, Oh, well that, that dualism we're talking about is like, it's matter. And then what matters? Like mm -hmm. those are, that's a really interesting way to kind of break that apart with the avatar. Um, you know, I think, well, when I think about like sex, I'm like, well, one, do I think it would be the same? No, at least not in anything that we have access to right now. Although we'll see what, where we're going with all of this, mm -hmm, right? In mm -hmm. terms of experientially. But then I go, yeah, no, things like Jesus', Jesus teachings was like, if you lust after a woman in your heart, well, it's like, okay, well, that we settled it there based on intent, based on attention. Mm -hmm. So I think attention is an important um, thing here. Like what, what is your attention on? Mm -hmm. What do you pay? I think that's a really good way to think about pay attention. It's like, what do you spend? What do you tend to? What do you pay attention to? And and if your attention, it, if you're in whether physical or digital world, if your attention is on um, the lusts of the flesh, the feeling of like, let's say your base desires, the fighting and fucking or whatever, it's like, well, you know, I don't think many of us argue a whole lot about like that not probably being the best of what we have to offer, like the most base of humanity. Now, I mean, I know there are um, there are philosophical positions that would just say like, you know, my body actually is an amusement park yeah. and I should treat it as such and just eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die and it just is what it is. Um, and, and, I, and OK, granted, like that is a a tenable position. Um, but when you come to like the idea of like sex, you know, it was weird as I was like, I don't know. I don't know. Like, that's why I'm a rambling about this. I actually have no idea. Um, but I do think it matters that like, I know that my wife would probably not appreciate it if I was meeting up with some lady avatar. Sure. Um, one, one of the things I heard about actually at this, like, uh, that kid that had, um, well, let's just say somebody that I had met that had uh, spent a lot of time in VR kind of that before they uh, uh, had gotten involved with this like church group that we had met with said, man, I was I was going to these virtual strip clubs. And apparently mm. I didn't even know this. So for those of you listening that were ignorant as me, apparently women have these like full body suits that they wear um, in in their house yeah. with a physical pole in their room. And they can dance on that pole and be completely represented in avatar form every move that their body makes or whatever. Yeah. Well, apparently that's a business. And apparently a lot of people show up there and spend a lot of money in these virtual strip clubs. What would my wife want me spending time there? No. Uh, is that a good use of my attention? Mm -hmm. um, what is, what is, what is revealed maybe in the, my inner world? by these actions, whether taken, whether I'm driving to the Mons Venus here in Tampa or whether I am putting on a headset and going to a digital version of this thing. 
and I and then I go, man, I I actually think like it just or I'm driving to a church building or I'm putting it on and going to one of these people's church services. Like, seems like the same thing. Like it's mm. it's these actions are demonstrating something inside of us. Which, by the way, I usually will say to people that say I believe this. Uh, let, you know, I believe God loves the poor, and I'm like, sure. oh, you do. Well, like like which poor? Like, can you tell me any of their names? Can you tell me like, because the reality is we'll say these things, but the reality is we don't believe them. Like we say, we believe things. And I, I actually think we can question what we say we believe. Yeah. And I go, well, look at your actions and they'll yeah. tell you what you believe. Like print out your credit card statement. It'll tell you what you value. Like th- that, that's actually like, look at what you do. And that's how you know what you believe. Like actually our, uh, our mutual friend, Adam and I have an ongoing joke about uh, what we call Bertrand Russell liberals. Those are people that love humanity but hate people. Mm-hmm. I think I think there are a lot of folks out there that, to your point, uh, that's right. Sure do love the poor, but haven't ever shook one of their hands or gotten to know them or learned their name even, right? Well, right. And if you go, no, if I audit everything about your life, what you yeah. believe deepest down is fuck the poor. Yeah. But you would never say that out loud. No. So we have a a public relations version that we t- a story about ourselves that we tell ourselves. Well, okay. Why am I saying all that? I'm saying that to go, I don't care if you're driving in the Mons Venus or if you're spending time in VR going to strip clubs or churches or whatever. I go, that's actually, it's actually testifying to an inner reality. So let me push back on yep. that a little bit though, because we just got done saying that in Christianity, the physical world, matters right and isn't just matter but matters yep. in an ultimate possibly eternal sense right um on the baptism question uh we you know there's two thousand years worth of tradition that says that that water that physical h2o matters because it can be a means of god's grace that god can actually use that physical water to cause spiritual good in your life right and i would go so far as to say that God used LSD in the same way that the church uses water in your life, right? There was a physical means of grace. I understand, I understand. So, um, you know, the flip side of that coin is the ugly side that says, well, okay, but physical bodies matter in sexual acts. So uh, if you're going to sit here and tell me that baptism needs to take place with physical water, then going to a strip club to count quote unquote for my wife to really have a leg to stand on, to be angry with me for going to it. There's gotta be an actual stripper there giving a physical lap dance. Otherwise it's just a video game. You know what though? There's a lot of people just watching videos on their internet devices. That's true. That are not physically present. That's true. Their arousal is quite real. That's true. And their lack of fidelity is quite real. And their, the way that they spend their attention is quite real. Like, so the, (laughs) the reality might be virtual, but the struggle is real. Like it actually, and this is what I'm getting at is like, you're right. But I see, this is the thing is I, I want to like push back against this, like breaking these things apart where I'm like, Mm -hmm. well, no, what you spend yourself on, what you invest your attention and life and resources in matters. Yeah. With your muscles, with your mind, with your body, with your sweat, with your tears, with your relationships. Like, it really matters. And so so I, I actually think but you saying that and that pushback is ideal because I'm like, no. And I, I actually think I'm coming down on the side of going, I think it's fine to be baptized in digital water. Okay. So so if I personally, because I'm actually thinking right now, I'm go, I'm like, okay, one, seriously, are we going to get – I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get stuck on something to invalidate uh, – uh, people, people making like uh, rites of passage into community. Mm-hmm. I, 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 that's that. Like, oh, you didn't do it right. Like people meeting Catholics and like we were sprinkled. You need to be dunked. I'm like, this is sure. the same old stuff sure. as far as I'm concerned. And actually, if is it public and is it a profession? And I'm, I'm, I am. So it's weird because I would, I would say so for people that are clear. I would go, no, I think you should get baptized if you're a Christian. Because, well, it was very simple. Jesus said, um, 
make disciples, baptizing them in my name, and then mm-hmm. teach them to obey everything I commanded. It looks to me like we just baptize people and then don't teach them to do anything that he commanded. And I go, okay, well, I think we need to teach them to do everything he commanded. Oh, right. and by the way, that actually starts with a baptism, which is a public display of a conversion of an announcement to my people that I'm doing this. This isn't a secret that I'm doing this. This is what I'm doing. And I go, I think that matters. Do I think it matters if it's physical or digital? I don't. I don't think that I do. Okay. I don't think that I think it matters. Um, so let me, yeah. okay. We danced around this a little bit earlier in the podcast, but I want to kind of make it a little bit more explicit. Uh, there's a philosopher named David Chalmers. Um, wrote an excellent new book called Reality Plus uh, about halfway through the book. Uh, it's taken me a while to read it because after every chapter, I have to kind of stop and just marinate for a while. So um, he makes the argument that the very idea of calling some, uh, a reality only virtual is a little bit silly because what he would argue is that what you are experiencing in a VR headset is very much real. Mm-hmm. If you see in a virtual headset that there is a couch in front of you, that couch is real. Now, it may not have the same nature of the couch that you are sitting on. It, it might be a couch that's comprised of ones and zeros rather than quarks and atoms. But it is a real couch because of how you experience it. Mm-hmm. And he says, now, it might not even be all that different because we might be living in a simulation, you know, going in the matrix direction. Yeah. And I if mean, we're living... E- Elon's it, been well, pretty... Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's like, I'm pretty sure that's what's going on. That's a super interesting argument in itself, right? Um, <laughs> But, you know, if we're living in a simulation, then there's no difference between the couches that you see in the headset and the couches that you sit on and your physical experience, whatever we mean by physical, quote unquote, if we are living in a simulation. Right. Um, I don't know, man. Like, so are you saying are you going all the way in the David Chalmers direction of saying, like, actually virtual reality? We should probably just remove the virtual from that and just say, like. This is the reality I experience in a headset versus the reality I experience without a headset. So this is interesting because I've already said that I don't think we should separate the like mm-hmm. soul and body, let's say. Right. Sure. So I don't I don't believe in disembodiment. OK. So I so John is someone that thinks what you do with your body really matters. Yeah. But then John also just said I can be baptized in a virtual world. And I go, yeah, I don't think these are the same conversation, actually. Okay. So so what I would say is and, and it is a little like Jesus saying, like, well, if you've if I've what 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 is you lust after this woman, you've already committed adultery, you old hatred against this brother, you've already murdered him. Like in mm-hmm, your heart. Mm-hmm. And I go, Oh, that actually I think is real. So um like real, real. And, and really matters. So like, how, how can I like say that is like, I do think what you do matters like, like physically, like, Mm -hmm. Oh, you, you, you say you believe all these things, but nothing you do lives up to it. However, at the same time, like if my life, well, like you said, I, I forget the, the Bertrand Russell liberals or whatever, but like you love humanity, but you hate people. Yeah. It's like, well, if you're, if you're a, uh, what would you call that? A misanthrope in mm-hmm. that way. Well, then you, you don't love humanity. You don't love humans. You don't love anything. And actually, and I'm, I'm using a caricature, but I'm like, no, I've known a lot of people that are just filled with resentment and rage and bitterness and disgust and self-righteousness. And I actually, and while they might stand for some really righteous causes, I go, "Mm, I see a, a, a decrepit soul. Like I see someone that like would more likely become a Hitler Mm. than anyone else. Now I think all of us are on a, on a potentially slippery slope. I I don't differentiate because I go, I am capable of the same monsterish monstrous behavior. I have my own style of doing it. Mm -hmm. This isn't a way to, be righteous in view of self-righteousness. It's just to go, no dude, sometimes um, we do really great things for really terrible reasons. So there's some really, I actually think a lot of people doing mercy work, doing care for the poor is not done out of a place of like being a whole healthy human being that's loved and oh, capable. I've, I've and met do- people like that. Absolutely. No, it's just yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I'm frantically trying to be valuable and yeah. I hope that God sees all the sacrifice and they're just living this, tortured martyrdom kind of life Mm -hmm. where, and, and, and they have terrible relationships, terrible respect boundaries, no love for themselves. 
Uh, and I go, this is exactly wrong. It's exactly wrong and upside down. And if you did that in a digital world or a physical world, mm. for whatever reason, so so I guess what I'm getting at, because uh, I did that whole like dichotomy dualism thing, is I think that the spirituality of a thing matters, and I don't mean spirits like devoid from physical bodies. I mean like uh, you could take a church building and you could judge it a church building. I'm sorry, a church community, a church organization. Sure. And you can judge the spirit of the thing. You can actually yeah. say, no, there's a spirit to this. There's a personality mm. to this corporate logo. Yeah. Right? There's a personality to businesses. There's a personality to, and that inner spirituality that is made manifest by the actions that this corporation takes, that this institution takes or whatever is real and nameable and in often cases it's a foot like people say oh like a familiar spirit it's like you can hear um there what's really weird and i'll just give you a great illustration i was at a protest one day um uh ab- it was about like it was it was it was i think it was at the beginning of like black lives matter and it was like talking about like the police and it was right in front of the police station here in tampa and I, I'd been to all these protests with all these people, and sure. I knew everybody, and I loved this group of people, and I stood with them. And they were out there crying out about, like, violence and, and, and oppression yeah. and, and all, you know, standing. And I was like, man, I believe all of this. But then the, 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 the tone of the community that was there crying out, it, as far as I could tell, was gripped by a spirit of resentment and violence and, and war. And I was mm. like, oh, interesting. The spirit the way that I said it to my wife when I went home is the spirit that I'm here to oppose possess the crowd that I was with. And, and that isn't a description of like a spirit floating around the sky. It's, it's an, it's an embodiment of a personality that grips us anger, yeah. resentment and hatred. I don't care if that takes place in your body or in your, in your avatar. I go, that's the realest stuff there is as far as I'm concerned. Man, that's super interesting. I'm struggling to respond because my mind is going in a thousand different places at sure. once. Um, cuz there's a what you're naming it is almost similar to like the concept of geist, right? Or it's almost similar it is. to uh, it the is. concept of um it's the zeitgeist, you know, that's of, right. So, yeah, some of some of the uh, some of the hermetic literature talks about egregores, right? Um, so you're you're talking about uh, I, I guess like a third reality almost, right? Cause we're not talking about bodies and we're not talking about minds anymore. We're talking about a, a spirit. That, and, and like you said, we're not talking about uh Casper, the friendly ghost. Disembodied spirit. Yeah, it's yeah, either. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, but we're talking about um, a very real phenomena that I think everyone that's listening, if we're, if they're being honest, has experienced at some point in their life that a, non-personal reality whether that be a a corporation or a crowd a non-personal reality takes on the characteristics of a personality well they and i would argue i would argue that they all do and by the way just for the individual human beings that might be listening in i think this is very well illustrated with emotions which by the way the ancients considered gods sure that makes perfect sense okay like anger take anger anger (laughs) i mean we even say, I can't believe I did that. I don't know what came over me. Yeah. Something took a hold of me. We we talk about it exact phenomenologically exactly the way it takes place, the way the ancients talked about it, like something came down from the sky and grabbed a hold of me and had its way with me and mm-hmm. made me act that way. Well, a- anger is a great example. You get filled with rage. And by the way, you can go to any culture in the world and they, they look quite similar when they're angry. They make the same faces. They make the same gestures. This isn't 100% the case. We have like, let's say, um, cultural um, versions or nuance to these things. But anger reads the same. Grief, sadness. These things map. The humans are in the grip of powers greater than themselves. And you could say, I don't believe in a god. Well, okay, I don't care what you call this. It is a power greater than yourself mm. that descent, that is universal, mm-hmm. that happens in all times and all places to all people, and it looks identical. It says the same things, and then we talk about it as if something outside of ourselves came over us and did something with us. And I go, it's that. 
It's mm. just that writ large, not just an emotional outburst, but in like the spirit of an institution, the spirit of a country, the spirit of a religion. It's it's the it's 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 its personality, its inner reality. And that I go, that's what spirituality is. Have you experienced that in VR yet? Because I think I might have. I've been to enough meetings uh, in the Engage platform that had their own personality. Mm. And let me be clear, the personality that I experienced in these meetings has thus far been very positive. And I would say that, uh, you know, I have a very small sample size to work with relative to so the number of meetings I've been to. But uh, I have experienced, I think, a little bit of this Geist Egregore personality reality that we're hinting at here in the metaverse, which kind of comes right back to a lot of the questions that we're facing about the relationship between physical reality and virtual reality. Share, share about that experience. I mean, I'll just say briefly yeah. that my experience has been mostly in blockchain communities mm -hmm. in discord, not VR, but sure. like overlapping. I would still sure. go part of this metaverse. I would say there are there. I would say in those spaces, I see warring spirits, but the overwhelming, the overwhelming preponderance of the spirit that I see is welcoming and friendly and we're going to make it and we're in this together. And yeah. we're, there is a movement kind of thing going on. Then on the flip side, there is this kind of like curmudgeonly impatient miserly trader type when when token kind of thing that is um, not maybe in it for the best of mm -hmm. intentions. And I'm not and I'm not hating on that. It's like, yeah, people are here to make some money, whatever. I, it's all good. Sure. But I do see that and I do see it being put in its place kindly. But one of those is quite kind. There's like an overwhelming kindness to yeah. the space. And then a and then a not so kind presence like a snake in the garden is the way that I perceive it. Now, yeah. tell me about your experience because that's well, the brief version of mine. Yeah, I think my uh, my sample size is probably too small to draw meaningful conclusions from. But like, you know, uh, I'll go to a meeting in the Engage platform, which for our listeners who aren't familiar is a uh, is a social VR experience. So you're there as an avatar that you've designed, uh, as an avatar that you have built. And you are able to have social experiences, whether they be business meetings or whether they be classes. We're planning on teaching classes and engage in the fall. Um, the meetings I've been to, probably like 95% of them have been uh, led by either my buddy Adam or uh, my dear friend Vince. And so it's very easy for me to see that spirit of welcoming, spirit of joy, mm -hmm. spirit of innovation and excitement and just say well that's because my buddy adam or my buddy vince is right. filled with joy right. filled with a, a, a desire to innovate a desire to explore and find what's oh next. and it's probably the so, case because leadership sure. matters absolutely we set tones absolutely um but all that to say even though it's easier for me to go okay well that just happened because uh adam was leading the meeting or vince was leading the meeting um and it would have been the same if we were in person or, you know, over Zoom or whatever. Um, but, you know, I'll say this, like experiencing it in VR does lend in my mind a little bit of credence to that idea that maybe there's not so thick of a boundary line between the real and the virtual. You know, this might not be the same topic, sure. but you asked me about the drugs. Yeah. No, it is. It, in my mind, it is the it, same topic. It, it, it very much. Well, yeah. I, I actually, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to stop thinking about this. So, yeah. by the way, for those of you listening that are into books, there's a really great book out right now um, called The Immortality Key. It was written by Brian Morosco. Morosco. I'm sure I'm not doing justice to the way you pronounce his name, but you'll find it. And um, this is a uh, well. He was a law lawyer trained, former lawyer. Um, that just got obsessed with this question of the role of hallucinogenics in history, in Western philosophy, religion, and not just Western. I find that entirely more relatable than I should. <laughs> no, dude. It is so good. It's such a good book. Um, because, and even reading the classics, he's like, you know, 
there's just these things that, you know, started to stand out to me. Like, you know, that's not what happens when you drink wine. Mm. Like the things that are happening to these characters and the visions and the, and the ecstasies. He's like, no, that's not how that works. I don't care how much wine you have. It's interesting you say that because I've often struggled with that old uh, saying in Vino Veritas, right? Or I'm sorry, in Vino Veritas, pronouncing my V's wrong. Uh, you know, there is truth in wine. Um, because man, I've been around a lot of drunk people in my day and I don't know that there's been well, too much truth out of that situation. So, so right? I, I, yeah, no, that's exactly right. Well, I will say that, uh, uh, perhaps, um, there's a window where you might be more prone to tell the truth. Um, um, truthfulness rather yeah, 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 than yeah, yeah, capital yeah, yeah, T truth, yeah, yeah, right? That's yeah, right. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. But no, in the old text, and that's the thing is these played such a, a sacred role. So what Brian Morosco does is he he starts exploring the ceremonial religious place, not just of wine, but of beer mm -hmm. and then of other chemicals. And what he finds is because he, he's like, look, I just, you know, they're drinking wine. Why are they having ecstatic visions that last for days? Right. And he's like, oh, well, if you trace this, he's like, this is, this is spiked wine. Yeah. And, but it's not like explicitly stated that it's spiked wine. It's just what we drink. It's like, oh yeah, it's wine. Well, uh, and then they go far enough back and he actually has like ethnobotanists that are like testing these old vases that are done out of archeological digs nice. and going, oh, we found these hallucinogenic compounds in these vases. He gets into like Vatican vaults. Okay. The, the dude gets access. He, he said he, he's funny in an interview. He said, I almost lost my marriage. Um, because I got so obsessed with the pursuit of this that I like never came home. Oh, he wow. was like, I was always gone, like digging in some vault and digging in, like I was at some archeological dig, yeah. but he's like, I, I got grip. Now this is a guy that's never used hallucinogenics, which I actually hope he maintains because, okay. because he is, it's a, it's a little bit of a credibility for those that want to question what he's doing. Like, well, you're just a, you're just a druggie. And he's like, no, I've actually never tried this. I'm just saying that this has played a significant role in the shaping of civilization, philosophy, and religion. And we might owe democracy to it. We might owe, and he's making statements that are like, we might owe everything. It's almost like evolution should be credited mm. with these hallucinogenic compounds. It's interesting. Cause like Michael Pollan makes a similar point in some of his writing on this topic where he says like, you know, look, prior to the invention of synthetic chemicals, a lot of what we're talking about is coming from mushrooms, right? It's coming from fungi That's right. that uh, are poorly understood. I'm not a biologist, but fungi are poorly understood from an evolutionary standpoint, from what I can tell. But there is the hypothesis out there that we are co-evolving together, and a lot of that has to do with the experiences they enable. Well, there's actually receptors in our brain that don't do anything else Right. But receive those chemicals. Explain that to me. Right. So. So, OK, the reason I'm bringing all of this up other than to go, you guys really need to read that book. Mm -hmm. It's so good. And just a little key point of that. So you can like just that the wine and beer stuff is there is a fungus that grows on um, like on these uh, grains that is called ergot. Ergot um, is a key ingredient in LSD okay. and that'll just play out like, Oh, that finds itself in beer. It finds itself in wine. It's like, there's a, there's a, uh, and it, and it's a problem. I mean, there's stories from all over the world of like, we had to just burn this entire field because it was completely ruined. It was covered in ergot or whatever, mm. but like, like it's a real challenge to growing the malt and the barley and the mm -hmm. things that you need to make beers and wines or whatever. Okay. So read that book. It's really great. But um, the reason I'm bringing that up is when, so I am someone who's had this experience. I've taken hallucinogenics and I actually say that my, my, I mean, my uh, conversion experience was an experience on LSD. Right. Um, and I've had extremely powerful experiences using these compounds and they map to a lot of what I read and a lot of what I hear. And this, so many people have had this experience. And when you talk to people that have had this experience that have had the, um, what's the word? Um, 
I I can't think of the word, but the transcendent kind of um. What do you? There's like a there's like a type of person like uh, mm. what is the person that would like? Uh, I'm drawing a blank. It's like that's okay. They have they take they would like take drugs on behalf of the community and like like a, sh- a shaman shaman shamanic, yeah, 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 shamanic, yeah, yeah, shamanic yeah. experiences. That yeah, yeah, that's yeah, actually yeah. A shaman, and it's like a shamanic experience is actually the thing that I would I would say is what's happening to people. Yeah. And what's interesting is they go. No, like people will come back from these experiences. You can look at Johns Hopkins research. Yeah. You can just look at the testimonies of people that take these drugs. You look at the books that have been written and all these things. And my own experience will say, no, 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 no. You don't understand. I understand that I was on a hallucinogenic. I understand that I was having hallucinations. I get that. But they were more real and more true than anything that is happening right now. So there was a more profound encounter with something like God and the truth and reality that illuminated everything that I experience in day in and day out reality. And I can cope with and deal with and know how to handle this world because I had that experience. And we go, well, you were just on drugs. And it's like, okay, sure. Yeah. And and I go, oh, this is why I think these are interestingly related. Right. And by the way, I actually think it won't be that difficult for VR to run through meditations and visual effects that induce. Because your own brain can produce DMT, by the way. Like okay. you can actually induce some of these things through guided meditation. So, so, so I go, we're going to. We're going to be able to come at this. And by the way, I would say, I would actually just argue just to yeah. land this. Both of those are just technology. Yeah. Amen. Um, I love that you said that because there are a lot of great spiritual masters out there from numerous different traditions that would make similar points to what you just made, which is that, you know, the the physical substance is a shortcut, but the, the experiences themselves are achievable through meditation through prayer through right. other spiritual practices right um yeah man it's interesting because okay so the temptation there is to reduce down to the material right to reduce down to what a spiritual experience is is to alter brain chemistry in some way whether it be through sure. lsd sure. or or some uh fungus or whether it be through meditation and prayer, or whether it be through a VR headset, that what a spiritual experience is, is to alter brain chemistry in some way. And so, so long as you're altering the brain chemistry to achieve the effects that you want, you've achieved spirituality in some way. But the dualism that I think that you and I are both angling towards doesn't allow for that, right? So I, I don't know that you and I are, I don't know that we're on the same page on this because okay. for me, I don't think, so I would say this, I don't actually, I think, I think we are existentially dualistic creatures. Sure. We experience dualism, mm-hmm. but I do not believe in dualism. Okay. So I do not believe that you can be disembodied. Okay. That there is no Ryan apart from Ryan's body. Okay. I don't believe that. Um, I do not believe, and that isn't to say I don't believe in a soul. Um, I just don't know that I can articulate exactly what that is in, mm. in some sense. I'm like, no, that is your body is alive. Yeah. So it's filled with like breath. You know what I mean? But hold on. Let me, yeah, let me yeah, just, yeah, so, yeah, so, so like what I'm saying here is I would say that the, the, I don't think that there is anything that isn't spiritual. Okay. So, so like, that's the thing is like, well, that is spiritual. So it's like, not just like, well, you take these drugs, you produce this effect and that's spiritual. Well, I'm like, yeah, because we are still thinking that there's physical and spiritual and you're somehow jumping a fence from one to the other. Mm. But I'm like, no, your body is spiritual. Your intentions, mm-hmm. what you pay attention to is your spirituality. Mm-hmm. You pay attention to God, AKA the highest imaginable good. If you fix your eyes on the highest imaginable good, Good things will come from that. You want to fix your eyes on what's wrong and what pisses you off and what you want to complain about. You're going to, you're going to end up in therapy. You're going to have a, a, you're going to have a hard time about life because you're going to be depressive and you're going to be anxious and you're going to have all these problems. And by the way, one of the best medicines on it would be to pay attention to someone else. 
right? And I go, no, where your attention is, like where mm-hmm. your where your heart is, there where your treasure is, there your heart will be. I actually yeah. think I actually think that's technically the case, and not in some woo woo otherworldly sense. It's like your treasure, like what. What do you wake up thinking about? What keeps you up at night? Right. What are the things that you're thinking about? And this is back to like an avatar having sex. I'm like, yeah, if that's what you want to do with your avatar. Like, cool. Like, I'm sure it's cool. Interesting. But I don't know if that, if that maps to what you're thinking, but for me, I go, it's all the same. I just don't even see the difference. Yeah. Interesting. No, I mean, we already established at the beginning of this episode that I'm a little bit more platonic than you are anyways. Right. So uh, yeah, no, yeah, I've, 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 fought, I, I love Plato. I love a lot of what's come from Plato, but I do not hold. I am far more ex. I, well, I am completely existentialist, mm-hmm. which was kind of the school of philosophy that like reacted to idealism. Mm-hmm. Um, was to be like, no, uh, there isn't an essence to John. Um, that begin mm. that is like the the John is existence first, sure. and then I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna see what I can make out of this. I'm gonna build from this, right? Um, and and I go, no, it's existence first for me. It's form first, function first, um, and and then call. But I do hold something like calling, that is like an ideal, like a it's a vision. I have a vision for the world that I think it should be, and I want to fight like hell to build it, to make it, to take responsibility to, to, and that is, may your kingdom come, may your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. That's what I think that prayer is. Sure. It's like, well, did you have to do it? So I'm going to take the long road around to getting to a response to that. Yeah. Um, so for our listeners that don't know, uh, I was a math major in college, and math has formed me as a person in ways that are both uh, professional. I've spent most of my life uh, since college as a math teacher, um, but also in ways that are spiritual. Math informs my spirituality in ways that are kind of weird, to to say the least. Hmm. One of the things... um, One of the things that you're struck by as a math major is that math kind of has a will of its own math doesn't really obey what the human mind thinks it should be let me give you an example please um when i was a junior in college uh, i had a class from the great boris schechtman at the university of south florida who is uh quite the character um boris used to say that the soviet union collapsed because he left (laughs) Um, you know, Boris would stumble into class, uh, at 6 PM at night, by the way, he apparently, this is possibly apocryphal, but apparently refused to have classes scheduled before 5 30 PM because he couldn't wake up on time. Otherwise, um, Boris would stumble into class at six and lean against the board. And I mean, do I do mean lean like standing upright might not have been within his powers at that point, but he would lean against the board and deliver the most brilliant lectures you ever heard in your life. Mm. One of the things that I learned from Boris is that there are infinities of different size. And this is true regardless. And, uh, you know, if our listeners are interested, like, please email me or reach out to me, and I'll be glad to walk you through this. I don't want to take podcast time on going through the proof of this. But uh, even... You know, infinity doesn't behave the way even our limited human understanding of it wants to behave, right? So you learn very quickly that math kind of has its own identity. But what is math? I, you know, I use this concept of the number three whenever I want to denote three objects, right? Like there are three pens on the table that you've used to write, or there are three, <laughs> you know, uh, three glasses that we've used to enjoy our, our beverages tonight or whatever. Like there are things that I can point to and apply the concept of three, but three also behaves on its own without me needing to do anything to it. Right. So, but what is three? Is it a physical reality? No, I don't think so because otherwise, um, three would be beholden to the physical world. Right. Right. Is three mental? No, it seems to have been there before the human mind uh, got to it, right? 
is three spiritual. Well, I don't know because I don't really know how to define spiritual, right? But math behaves in ways that aren't um, beholden to the human mind and they're not beholden to physical reality. Ma the history of our discovery of math is filled with examples of this, right? So you ever heard of uh, Everest Galois? No. Okay. So Everest Galois uh, was a 19-year-old French kid who died uh, in the 1800s uh, fighting a duel we believe over a love interest, because really, what else is there to fight a duel over, right? Um, so every Galois, the night before he dies in this duel, hands his journals to his buddies. And again, he's 19 years old. He says, listen, um, if I die tomorrow, make sure that Fourier and Laplace get these journals. Fourier and Laplace were the leading mathematicians in Paris at that time. He dies in the duel. His buddies take the journals to Fourier and Laplace. And after reading through it, uh, Fourier and Laplace eventually realize that this 19-year-old kid has discovered an entirely new branch of mathematics. And he's written about it in his journal. Um, nobody sees any practical purpose for this. We now call it abstract algebra or group theory sometimes. Group theory is a topic within abstract algebra. Um, mathematicians don't imagine that it has any correlation to the physical world whatsoever for 150 years. And then a guy by the name of Peter Higgs in the 1950s is trying to figure out how particles in the physical universe have the property of mass. And he's not really sure what to do, but he's stumbling through the library and he pulls a book down from the shelf and it's an abstract algebra book. And he realizes that in this abstract algebra book is the exact math he's been looking for. And he's able to predict the existence of what's now known as the Higgs boson which was experimentally proven to exist, I guess, 10 years ago-ish mm -hmm. through CERN, maybe 12 years ago. I'm fuzzy on the timeline. Anyways, um, math had this reality, had this will of its own that we discovered before we were able to correlate it to the physical world and didn't seem to come purely from the human mind either because there is a correlation to the physical world. So math to me presents um, a challenge to those who would completely um, deny Platonism because to me math stands as a non-physical, non-mental reality that we have to account for um, in some way. And what's interesting to me, and to tie this into our conversation mm. here, is that um, I wonder where virtual reality falls into this uh, triangle that I've built, right? We've got the physical, we've got the mental, and we've got the something else. We talked about Egregores or, or Guy's store, you know, the, the spirits that you talked about. Yep. Um, we talked about, I've talked about math. Like there's this triangle of existence, right, that seems to um, be a stumbling block. And I'll say this, like I... I'm super appreciative of existentialism. Yep. Uh, we talked about me being a Dostoevsky fan last episode. You can't be a Dostoevsky fan and not be a fan of existentialism, right? Um, I'm probably more on the Kierkegaard end of the existentialist spectrum than I am on the, uh, I don't know, the Heidegger end of that spectrum. Um, but, you know, if we're taking existentialism to be a denial of Platonism, I can't go all the way there because... Math fucks me up on that. Well, yeah, it's interesting hearing you articulate it that way. So I do not pit any of these against each other. Sure. But I do go, no, on the, on the like, dualism thing, yeah, existentialism has my vote 100% of the time if I pit them against each other in, like, that dialogue. And yet the idea that there are – because what I hear you saying is there is objective truth – that transcend that that precedes and transcends any physical manifestation, and isn't a construct of uh, a subjective mind. Yes, and to be clear, I'm not a hundred percent sure if we can push that beyond math, and that's part of my religious makeup. But if we can't push it beyond math, it still is out there. I. Well, that's funny. That might be for another day. I yeah, man. definitely think you push it beyond math. Nice. Um, okay. Because I think you can push it into the world of values 
and I actually think there are just things that are okay. more true. Um, I think there, yeah, I, I think there are, uh, you know, we even say to stay true to things, right? Like, mm. I, I actually think there is something about that that maps to the, like, the way that you might um, discern the spirits of the institutions or to, dis- like, there is something true. Now, it may not be as algorithmic, as measurable and scientific uh, as mathematics, mathematics does fall into a camp that does like uh, do well with enlightenment thinking um, like that, you know, so, yeah. so, so, so I don't, I don't know that I, I don't know that I have the chops to differentiate that, to be honest with you. I don't know. I don't, I don't know math philosophy well enough. I, God, I wish I did. It's all right. um, That's what I'm here for. Yeah, no, we'll I'm excited <laughs> about these conversations. Um, I, I, when I was in religious studies, um, we would actually, it's funny. My senior seminar was, uh, we read Lord of the Rings nice, and the Silmarillion, um, as religious text. So, okay, cool. You learned all this stuff about religion. Now we're going to read, uh, who wrote that? Tolkien. Tolkien. Yeah. I almost said Tolstoy. Tolkien. (laughs) Um, we're going to read Tolkien. And we're going to read it. I mean, if, if those of you that listening that um, Sil- Silmarillion is the like creation myth of the world that is that Lord of the Rings exists within. It does read a lot like uh, a religious text. Oh, for sure. But then even the stories of Lord of the Rings have uh, there's a lot taking place there. But what always stuck with me and I'm not going to go off on that, but what always. So one, I thought, what a brilliant 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 senior seminar class Mm -hmm. like you know there's 15 of us sitting in a circle debating and talking through this book but in the context of religious studies in this college or whatever and it was it was so good for me um and it wasn't tied to anyone's religious faith or beliefs Mm -hmm. or whatever Mm -hmm. it was such a brilliant way to do that but what stuck with me out of that was i actually realized that magic and technology is the same thing. And everything that's ever been written or said about magic is a philosophy of technology. Yes. And then I go, oh, now today we're having a conversation about technology. Like, oh, you have this VR headset or you have this accessibility or you have all of these things being made possible by technological advancement. But the reality is we are becoming sorcerers. We are becoming magicians. We are, there, there is no differentiation between what it is. So, so by the way, when you said, well, um, what is the difference when you're, if your avatar is having sex, my mind actually went to magic because I was like, well, what if my avatar is using a Ouija board or doing spells mm. or like, would I be, would I feel like it mattered if I went into VR and I use my avatar to do magic, to do spells, to do witchcraft, mm. to conjure the dead. Like, right? And I go, oh, no, actually, I don't have any problem answering that. I go, no, that would be the same as if I did it right here in this room. It's identical. And it's so crystal clear that that's the case to me that I it answered all the other ones. I love that so much, John. Um, while you were talking, I pulled up a quote that you reminded me of. It's from a guy named Thomas King Whipple. He says, quote, Of late, there has been some talk, and very interesting talk, too, about machines as works of art. <laughs> Why not reverse the process and look at works of art as machines? Such an identification of art and machinery is not unwarranted. In the beginning, they were one and the same thing. They served the same single object, the gaining and ruling of power. This was in the days when they were both indistinguishable parts of primitive magic. As they have developed and differentiated, however, machinery has remained true to its original purpose, but specialized in handling only physical power. Art, on the other hand, which should specialize in conveying psychological power, has relinquished its office. Consequently, it finds itself in the doldrums, although it has vital work to do that can be done by no other agency. The world has urgent need of it, 
Both the world and art would benefit if the arts could be persuaded to resume their original and proper business to play once again the role they played in early magic. End okay, quote. one, what I absolutely love that quote. I, I, what really excited me about it was that it actually spoke straight to the dualism we've been talking about yeah, the man. entire time that technology focused on the physical and then art focused on the spiritual, the what matters, the big questions, the whatever. And actually, what's interesting is one of the things that's really excited me as you look at the emergence of some of the blockchain technology stuff that's happening and the emergence of the NFT space, there's all these mm -hmm. ridiculous art pieces, these art things that are – because art is the original <laughs> function of it. And yeah. art and technology is now coming back together in a way that is bringing – meaning and community com images of community into technological advancement in a way that we've never seen. And I actually go, Oh, interestingly enough, uh, we might be seeing, uh, the answer to the prayer of that quote. Wow. Shit, man. I don't think I'm going to be able to top that. So, <laughs> uh, what do you say we, uh, yeah. in this, in this, uh, journey on a positive note, John, what's the, uh, best movie or TV show that you have watched recently? I mean, I feel like you asked me this last time. I'm I not sure I've done much since. That's what okay. did I, yeah. Um, I have been excited to see the end of, um, better call Saul. Okay. Uh, so I was a huge breaking bad fan and I've watched all of better call Saul, which is a prequel of mm -hmm. the character, Saul Goodman that, um, Starts as Jimmy McGee, turns into Saul Goodman, and by the end, and it has so many of the same characters. So by the end of the show, like I haven't seen the last like five or six episodes. I'm like waiting for access to them yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But and I'm eagerly waiting for access to them. Um, but they are the show is Breaking Bad now, which immediately makes me have okay. to watch Breaking Bad again because I'm like, oh, that's a reference in the first episode of Breaking Bad that they now have just given so much context to that I had no clue of. And it's like, when is the first time I met this character or this character or this character or this character? So now I'm I'm just back in. I've, I've actually Sweet. started watching Breaking Bad again um, because of it. I like it. I like it. Uh, I just this week watched the new, I guess you could say, Norm MacDonald special that was like the last thing he recorded before he passed away. That's basically just mm. him. Uh, in a video camera in his home during the height of the pandemic. Um, fascinating, fascinating look at him as a comedian, as a, an artist. Um, highly recommend it, even if you're not a Norm MacDonald fan, because there's also commentary at the end of it uh, where people like Dave Chappelle and mm, uh, Adam so Sandler and David Spade, uh, um, a couple other folks comment on the art form of stand up and the art form of what Norm Macdonald was able to bring, which, you know, to relate it back to our last little bit there is definitely a form of magic. Yeah. Uh, John, if you were stuck on a desert Island with only one alcoholic beverage at your disposal, what are you picking and why? Woodford reserve double oaked. Okay. Um, that is that is a single oaked. Uh, mm. That is the single. They don't make the the nips in that, which I didn't even know these nips exist. But someone got them for me as a gift, and I was like, "This is genius." Nice. Uh, but yeah, the double oaked Woodford Reserve is just so so right. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's just my favorite. That's it. Very simple. Interesting. I'm gonna come at this from a different branch of the same family tree, and I'm gonna say uh, Talisker Ten Year Scotch, which. Uh, my buddy Zach, who Zach, if you're listening, hey buddy, uh, Zach recommended this to me a couple years ago after he had spent several months in Scotland and said, "Listen, uh, this scotch tastes like you are spending a day on the dock by the sea, and it's gray and cloudy, overcast, but there's joy in your soul." Mm. And I was like, "Holy shit! I hope it lives. <laughs> I hope I hope this lives up to a tenth of that description." Yeah, and. Uh, Man, not only does it live up to it, it exceeds expectations. Talisker ten year scotch. Man, oh man. Um, John, what is one book that you recommend to our listeners uh that most people probably haven't read? Well, I do think I already recommended the immortality key. You and did. I do think you guys seriously need to get that. Um, but since I already recommended that, I'm gonna say 
the first one that comes to mind and it's probably the book I quote the most is GK Chesterton's book orthodoxy. Nice. Um, I think he's one of the most phenomenal writing writers that ever existed. The guy yeah. is absolutely brilliant. His, his prose are poetic. Like he is just such mm-hmm. a good turn of phrase artist. Mm-hmm. Um, and does well with like paradox. And I, I just couldn't recommend that book more. Uh, all of his books are great, but Orthodoxy is definitely the one that I try to read every year at some point and damn near have memorized at this point. Well, shit, I was going to go with another answer, but uh, now that you've put me onto the topic <laughs> of G.K. Chesterton, um, The Man Who Was Thursday, yeah, uh, which, John, I think you know my youngest child's middle name is Thursday yeah. for precisely that reason. Um, you want to talk about art as magic. The Man Who Was Thursday... Uh, mm. Uh, and, and talk about art as possibly inspiring or being inspired by hallucinogenics. Um, the Man Who Is Thursday is a trip, both in the lowercase t and capital case t sense, and uh, reveals a lot about the inner workings of the human soul and the inner workings of the cosmos writ large, in my mind. I absolutely adore that novel, mm. The Man Who Is Thursday. John, if somebody pointed a gun at your head and said, John, you need to quit your job and pursue a hobby full time. What would that hobby be? Well, I have a problem with the question, so Go for it. I can't be told what to do at gunpoint. <laughs> so so I, that's the end of John. I actually, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I actually think I'd rather die nice. than have someone dictate anything. Spoken like uh, a true existentialist. So, so that's going to be problematic. However, nice. if there's a hobby that I want to spend my time doing. Man, I don't know the answer. Okay, so I don't see my life the way that people do. Like, I have a job. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a obsession, a vocation. I have a calling. Um, but the thing that doing it takes me away from is actually what we're doing on this show. I'm really glad we're doing this. It's scratching an itch. It would not be hard for me to go straight up ivory tower, to go yeah. into a life of the mind, Every day I want to read everything. Yeah. I have an insatiable curiosity. Um, and I think my, my, I have, I could go deep philosophical. I would just say that like, I also just believe in like practical philosophy. So like mm-hmm. my life is practice as like, I would say if I had to go, what is, what am I doing out here? I go practical philosophy. So I have ideas. I go flesh them out. And then I come back and think, are they still true? And then I go flesh them out and then come back and think, are they still true? And then go flesh them out. And I don't think you can just go ivory tower. Mm. I actually don't think that can be done. You can't Mm. disembody the Mm. uh, truths, but, um, is that maybe the death of the Academy that we're with? Yeah, no, I I actually think it's super problematic. However, uh, being out here and embody- embodying all the time, uh, leaves very little time to sit and read books. And, yeah. uh, like I've been carrying around the book that you recommended to me last. Uh, I have read like a page of it and it's been weeks and I'm like, I just have to find time. I can't remember what I recommended to you last. Was it torture and Eucharist? Torture and Eucharist. Oh my God. I love that book. <laughs> Speaking of embodying philosophy and embodying theology. Well, since you basically stole my answer, John, um, I have to come up with a new answer on the fly. And I guess the new answer would be uh, playing the bagpipes. Um, For our listeners who don't know, uh, my mom passed away a little less than two weeks ago. But uh, about six months before she did pass away, she asked if I would learn to play the bagpipes to play her funeral. And um, for those of you that don't know the bagpipes, you know that that was basically an impossible uh, favor for her to ask. Um, (laughs) The vast majority of bagpipe teachers will force you to play on something called a practice chanter for six months to a year, but um, before you ever get onto the full set of bagpipes. So, giving me only a couple of months to to learn well enough to play at a funeral was, you know, ridiculous. Um, also, I don't play any other instruments. I don't have a musical background at all. Um, so, thanks, mom. But uh, my wonderful former colleague Patrick, who I used to teach with. Uh, at a, at a former school that employed me was such an excellent teacher that uh, he pulled me under his wing. We had some really intensive lessons. 
I was able to do it. I actually played Amazing Grace at my mom's funeral on Saturday, and uh, it wasn't terrible. It didn't suck. Um, and along the way, I've kind of found a newfound passion for the bagpipes, and I think I'm going to stick with it, and I'm thinking it's going to be my new thing, my new hobby. So I'm super excited about that. I'm super excited to to continue to learn to uh, God, to re- to wrestle that uh, yeah. weird octopus of an instrument and uh, continue to squeeze delightful sounds out it's of it. It's such a beautiful instrument. If played it can well. be, if played, if played well, well. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Um, John, for our listeners who maybe don't know the Christian tradition well and are maybe thinking of exploring more about the Christian tradition, uh, what is one thing that they should investigate more about if they really want to get to the essence of Christianity, the heart of Christianity. And and I'm going to leave that wide open in terms of, you know, is there a book? Is there mm. a sermon? Is there a uh, practice? Is there a, a book of the Bible? I'm going to leave that wide open. Like if, if our listeners are like, you know what, uh, Christianity is kind of interesting. I want to find out more about it. I don't really have a background in it, but I don't want to take LSD. What should they do? Yeah, uh, that's a really hard question. I would probably, I mean, obviously, reading about the life of Jesus mm-hmm. in the New Testament is, uh, I, I'm going to assume that's just going to be part of that. Um, and then I would couple that with, um, so I want to say just, digging into liberation theology yeah uh in particular well it, n- liberation theology in general and then i would say you know the father of that's really considered gustavo gutierrez mm-hmm. um the power of the poor in history uh a, th- uh a theology of liberation some of his writing um but then uh there is this school of thought uh that really kind of came after vatican II. vatican II said that like the church is for the people of god and then in there was a gathering of bishops in in medellin that said well then who are the people of god uh and and among which came out of that is like it is the poor it is the worker it is the, the 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 disenfranchised and there is this school of theology that was born um that that had a ton of political engagement, but like honestly was born and for better and for worse, whatever, but was born out of a, 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 a really good reading of scripture that would push the reader of the Bible, the new Testament, the old Testament to read from the vantage point of the poor and the oppressed, um, which I just don't think uh, the Bible can be comprehended and understood without that mm. gift. Um, to read with the poor and the oppressed uh, is the even better move. But mm-hmm. if you can to put yourself in their shoes at least and read it empathetically, um, that would be my encouragement. If you were after the real, real, um, yeah, that's such a good answer. I, You know, I believe in an embodied Christianity, right? I I believe in being able to touch stuff. That's what, you know, to take it right back to the beginning of the episode, uh, that's what I loved about my son's answer of, you know, no, I need to touch some water. I need to get actually physically wet here. Um, Because of my deep love for embodied Christianity, uh, I'm going to say if you have available to you a really, really good liturgy to attend, uh, where the story of Jesus is embodied in interesting and beautiful and artistic and magical ways. Um, maybe that's an Eastern Orthodox church that has a, an English liturgy. Maybe that's an Anglo Catholic church near you. One of the best examples, if you happen to be in the Boston area, uh, there's a parish called All Saints Episcopal that is in the Dorchester neighborhood that has a, a liturgy that will take your breath away and let you watch the story of Christianity in fleshed. Um, but, you know, taking it right back to this question of mind, body, spirit that we keep uh, yeah. coming back to, um, I like Christianity in the flesh. So go to a, an incredible liturgy or perhaps even better, 
go to a food kitchen where Christians are feeding the poor because you'll see Christianity and flesh even better there in a more beautiful, artistic, and magical way. Well, I just added that. If you yeah, go man. somewhere where people are serving the poor, you may or may not see Christianity right. embodied there. There's a lot of people feeding hungry people. That's true. But um, I do think if you're able to engage in direct relationship and dialogue with those that are there. In fact, I would actually say if you could only go one time to a place where people are serving the poor, you should get in line and receive services and talk to the people in line Mm. rather than going and volunteering. So if you could only go one Mm. time, you should go as a recipient in line. Um, there is going to be far more encounter and reality that takes place waiting with each other, dialogue and receiving those services together. Um, I, 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 in as much as you can, you want to take the relational approach, in which case I would say get in line. Don't go sign up to volunteer. I love that. Well, folks, whether you have listened to us because you love us and you want to hear what we have to say or because you hate us and you're looking for dirt on us, we're grateful that you tuned in. We're grateful that you downloaded this episode. Uh, We invite you to hit that subscribe button and stay tuned for more because uh, we are just getting going here at the Catacombs. And any of you that want me to baptize you in VR, just hit me up. I got you next week. Uh, We're going to do a whole service. No big deal. Amen, Pastor John. Amen. (laughs) Take care, folks. Thanks very much.